the the leader of uh of uh five percent nation yeah. you know, um leader the leader of the five percent nation is uh which was a uh, Clarence yeah, it was calling Clarence Thirteen X when he was a member in the Mars. He used to be a student minister under Malcolm X and a lieutenant in the FOI. Mm. And you met him. I was taught by him. You was taught directly under. Directly, him. he saved me from the police a week before Thanksgiving, nineteen sixty four. I stole a hat out of Lee's uh, Stetson store, a, a, a cashmere hat. At the mm-hmm. time, it cost twenty dollars. And they call it a Fletcher. Mm -hmm. And I was running down 125th Street, turned the corner at 7th Avenue, running uptown, going across 126th Street. And he was in the World War Bar, and he came out, and he stopped the police from shooting me in the back or whatever the case may be because he told the police. I didn't hear him, but I looked back and seen him tell the police he couldn't run on his sidewalk chasing me. And the police went in the street against traffic. Traffic was going downtown. I was running uptown. And the police just, ah, fuck them. And I got away. And I came back and thanked the man who did that. And when I came back to thank him the next day, he wasn't on the corner in front of the World Works Bar on 126th Street. He was on 127th Street and 7th Avenue. And I thanked him by voicing it. Thank you. You know, and he winked at me and smile, but he had a cipher around him and he was building. And what he was saying is what I was feeling. Mm. And I was with him ever since then. So what type of man was he? Describe him. I describe him as a father who loved his children. That's the best way I could describe him. And not only did we call him the father, <clears throat> because that's, as a young 16 year old youth, the image that he projected, but he was a seriously courageous man. He the only man that I knew that his brothers was being held in the basement on 127th Street at gunpoint. And he was told that they was being held until he come down there because they wanted to see him. And instead of him going to get a gun or running like a coward and hide, he immediately went in the basement to face his would-be assassins. That's what kind of courage he had. And he went down there and got shot and left for dead. When he could have ran, or he could have ran and got a gun, and then went down there and fought. He was a military man. He was a veteran of the Korean War, and he seen war. He walked on the dead before. You know, he walked over minefields, as he told me. He had all kind of courageous medals from uh, the Korean War. But he was really, really, really courageous. And he, he came to save his people, more specifically the young. And, and that's what he did. That's what kind of man he was. And, and and he treated me, you know, with a lot of love. He used to walk up to me and kiss me on the cheek and give me a hug and a five before he gave it to his son. Mm. And a lot of people got jealous at that. But I was one of his serious students. I taught a lot of people and went to a lot of places and taught. And more importantly, a lot of people don't know it, but when they had him in Manawa, taking him through the persecution that they did for 22 months, I was in the street and doing my work and attracted higher government officials to recognize us as civilized people. High government officials was the governor of New York State that when he wanted to re, uh, campaign for re-election in Harlem, he sent emissaries to, I would say me, but I was on the committee, uh, the political action committee for How You Act, and I was a youth director, and I was a co-chairman with a brother named Naheem of uh, the political action committee, How You Act, under Miss Shirley Middleton. And we had a meeting that we didn't call, but they called Inspector Witt. Eldred Witt, he was the first deputy uh, chief, the first black deputy chief of New York City police. Captain Hill, Arthur Hill, he was the second 
black lieutenant of the 28th precinct, or either the second black lieutenant, I mean, captain, excuse me, captain of a precinct, that, uh, John Hill, he was the captain of the 32nd precinct and a Latin uh, captain from the 3030 that I don't remember. But at 17, like, they came and sat across the table with us to negotiate uh, as they made a supplication that Governor Rockefeller sent them to get our assurance that the five percenters would not harm or hurt his campaign workers if they campaign in Harlem, South Bronx, and Bethesda Stuyvesant. Mm-hmm. And we gave them that assurance that as long that we civilized people, as long as they came in our community not telling no lies and deceiving our people, they won't have no problems out of us. But before we can consent to that, we got to go and see the father who's in Manawa and get his permission to give that assurance. And they say, that's what we want. You know, and I brought that to him, and it showed him, I guess, that we was on ours and made people that we had fought. This was in 66 when it happened. Mm -hmm. We fought in 63, the fruit stand ride, the police. That was us and the police. And we fought in the Harlem ride. That was us against the police. And we fought in the 1965 uh, blackout and the 1965 Lexington Avenue uh, riot, police riot, you know, and I was led by five percenters. So they knew that, you know, we were somewhat adversarial towards them as they was to us. And now we had a negotiating table talking high politics, and they came on behalf of the governor of New York State. And uh, to show how effective we was politically, that when Dr. Martin Luther King got assassinated, mm-hmm. we stopped in 19... We, Perhaps started it and stopped it, the 1968 ride in Harlem. And Lindsey came up, got with a law, walked the streets, and assured the father that he wasn't going to give no orders to shoot no children, like Chicago Mayor Richard Daly gave his police orders to shoot and kill police. And when Lindsey came out, the people seen that here's a white mayor they cared about black people and Dr. Martin Luther King. And we stopped that ride. And then on that Sunday, we was at a uh, Central Park bandstand, the, the Great Mall. Mm-hmm. Who would hug the father on the bandstand? The top man in New York State at that time, Governor Nelson A. Rockefeller. And that was reported in the New York Magazine by Gloria Stennon. Gloria Stennon was a white woman who had an organization. In memory, right? Yeah, because, I mean, I lived it. You know, uh, she was uh, the president of NOW, the National Organization for Women. Mm. And she wrote the article in the New York Magazine, The City on the Eve of Destruction. And she had the father, Lindsay an Empire State Building on the cover of that magazine. And in that magazine, cover story, she wrote uh, the the surreal happening that Governor Rockefeller hugged the super militant revolutionary Allah on that bandstand. Yeah. You know, and, and I was instrumental in giving him that assurance that we wasn't going to tear the city up. Real quick, do you remember the fruit stand, what happened? Uh, the fruit stand riot? Yeah. Somebody lost their eye, too, I heard. Yeah, um, one of the men that came to the young brother's aid. Yeah, what do you what do you remember from that story? Well, a young brother, about 10 years old, was said to have taken an orange off the stand. And it was a Italian guy who was one of the fruit stand workers or either owner. And he was beating the young brother up. And I guard and justice in them was coming from school, and they seen this grown man beating up the young ten year old brother, and they beat the grown man's ass, and he being a store owner or either a store worker, the police came to his defense almost immediately, but they didn't know 
that these young brothers had learned karate on the roofs of 129th Street and wasn't taking no shit. And they beat the police up and took their clubs and chased them on about their business. And the police came back with reinforcements and clubbed them up and was taking one brother, I think it was Justice, <clears throat> to the police car, and they wouldn't allow it. They went and got Justice back from the police car and dragged him back down the block. Mm -hmm. And the police said, I stay prisoner, and they went and got Justice again and dragged him. And that went on a couple of times until they called uh, Super Duper Reinforcements, the new tactical forces. And that new tactical forces came with ax handles to fight teenagers. And that kind of quelled everything because they didn't have the strength, the young brothers didn't have the strength to fight three forces of grown ass men, especially the ones with the ax handles. Mm. Yeah. How, how long, how long did that ride go on for? I, it, I, I couldn't say, but it was contained just in that block. 129th Street between Lenox to 7th Avenue. Off of Lenox Avenue to 129th Street between Lenox and 7th Avenue. And um, what was what was the governor name that hugged? John, I mean, uh, Nelson A. Rockefeller. Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller. <laughs> don't forget nothing, son. You don't forget anything. I lived it, man. It was serious. I mean, the, the C... Like, the father at that time in 1968, he had been home a year and a month from Manawa. They put him in Manawa because they said he was crazy because he said he was Allah, the God. Mm -hmm. And they put him in Manawa, and they let him out of Manawa, gave him everything he wants, and now the top man in the state is on his dick. So how crazy what? was he? How crazy could he have been? <laughs> and, and look, it was 72,000 people there. <laughs> It was 72,000 people there. Yeah. So he ain't had no shame. And he and he thanked them. Read the article. You can dig yeah, it up. I'm, no, that's, I'm pulling, no, no. I'm pulling yeah. it up. Yeah, 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 yeah. It said it, you guys, uh, prevented. It said, uh, it's under the cooperation. It's under a cooperation and conflict section. Ah. Uh, where you, after Martin Luther King's death. Right. Okay, you yeah, got it. Said, yeah, yeah, yeah. 1968, Lindsay. Create about the riot in Del Curran Harlem. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, it's an actual fact. So, <laughs> what? They said that he was assassinated. Are yeah, you... he was. Uh, got you. Said... <laughs> yeah, um, hold on. Hey, yo, hey, yo Ebok, can we get, can we get the, uh, uh, a lot be some not, more? Not on, cam not on camera. I'm uh, off camera? No, you're not off camera. Okay, well. He got a port over there for me. Yeah, 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 got you. <laughs> this is on camera. You talking about it? I know. It's live. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <You should be. laughs> yo, that's yeah. not nice, man. You gonna uh, shake a cup like that instead of just saying, "Yo, oh, come hey. on, you shake a cup with some." <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, I ain't no beggar. Jeffrey, I ain't no beggar. <laughs> so, yeah, yo, yo Ebot, please come in here. Um, so. He was, uh, can you take his cup, please, and and tell them to refill the refreshments for the young man, please. No, no, it's all right. I, 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 uh, um, she would know. Um, yeah, that's going to know. Yeah. So, <laughs> some man, buddy, my man shook the cup. <laughs> Jeffrey? I mean, I know. <laughs> yeah, not on camera. You don't want it on camera. Nah. Yeah, you can bring it. Yeah, no, bring just pour it in and hit me off. Thank you. Man. <laughs> what? <Sorry. laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> so, thank you. Close the door, please, Thanks, bro. My man. Yes. Thank you. Man. So, question. Yes. You were directly, like, you were working with him. Yeah. You know what I mean? You respected this man. Um, his wife said that she believed that the NOI tried to assassinate him because he called himself Allah, which implied that he was above, uh, I guess. Master Farah Muhammad and yeah. Elijah Muhammad. Yes. So mm -hmm. do you agree that they attempt, there was an attempt I, on his life? I, I don't know. Uh, 
we we some people thought that because the police said that he was targeted before Malcolm X. He got shot before Malcolm X. Malcolm X got shot and killed in 65. The father got killed, I mean shot in 64. So the, shot where? What, what, what was he doing? How did he get shot? He got shot in the basement of 127th Street, the incident I told oh, you. Oh, that, left, that left him for dead? Yeah. So so you, you paraphrased on it, but what do you remember about that incident? Well, I wasn't there, number one. Understood. And I did react it because I came downtown when I heard that it happened, and I came with a force, and we was right, strapped and everything. But it wasn't no information to be found and nobody to be found. But it was said different things that supposed that occurred. That one, he left the mosque and he was teaching in the street and the Muslims didn't like that. Okay? But at the time, we didn't know nothing about no Muslims using guns. Mm. Okay? So it was kind of discredited because it might have been, you know, gangster Muslims that did use guns, but they wouldn't use it from the orders of Malcolm. Malcolm was still a minister. No, Malcolm had just got uh, exiled. He wasn't still minister. But the minister that was there, they wasn't using guns as far as we knew. Uh, it was something in the street about somebody that was close to the father was extorting uh, hustlers using his name. Mm. And they were supposed to have came back uh, against him, but not against the people that was using his name. So that didn't make no sense. It didn't, doesn't it? You know, so the speculation was just that, speculation. It was never no direct mm. finger pointing, identifying who was the perpetrators. But basically what happened was they told him that somebody's downstairs. Yeah. In the basement. He got a word that And he went down there. And they shot him and left him for dead. Yeah. How much times he got shot? He got shot first with a shotgun across the chest. As he told me, he was advancing at the person. And he would have got him. But the guy backed up and blasted him with the 12-gauge shotgun across the chest. And he said it didn't knock him down. But it, the force of it pushed him back. And he still was on his feet, and he was still going at the dudes, Jews, and that's the term he used, his Jews. That's what we used to call the nuts, the family Jews, right? And he said the dude was so sharp that he took another step back, and this time he fired a sawed-off 30R6, which is an elephant rifle. You know, this is the gun that bring elephants down. And he said that one Man. hit him in the collarbone, pierced his heart, went through his lungs, and lodged in his right shoulder. And he demanded I feel it twice, once in Manawa and once in the street. And I had to feel it. And I asked him, did it hurt? And he said, what do you think? You know, and it hurt him. But he wanted me to feel it, to let me know what he took for us. You know? But why did he go in the basement? What he went in the basement because he was fearless and courageous, and he went to save his people. That's what he said. He went to save his brother. Otherwise, they'd have killed them, and it wasn't for them. He knew that they didn't come because of no uh, extortion or somebody coming. He knew that this was sent by the government. He knew that. and He, so, he had to take the shot. That's the word he said. He had to take the shot. And he told me I had to take the shot. My shot was going to prison for 27 years. And the other two brothers that he told with me, Java, he took the shot at 19, and he died. He got shot in the heart August 8th, 1970. And Dubar, that was with me, he got arrested that uh, week. And I got shot that Monday, August 3rd, 1970. He told all of us we had to take the shot. Wait, but hold on. I know, I know, I know. It's, it's Got me a little, got me a little yeah, lost here. I know. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but, that, I, but that's what he said he had to take the shot. And you're bringing me to the vision of, uh, like, I feel like I'm there. I, I don't want to take the shot right now, so let's... I don't, just, I don't blame you. Yeah, please. I didn't want to take it. Yeah, I mean, it hurts. Let's talk about this. So, he gets shot. You go see him in the hospital. No, I didn't go see him in the hospital. I went to see him in Manawad. That was years later. 
but no, uh, Manwa. Prince in Manawa. That's a, uh, uh, what's that? A hospital for the criminally insane. You said that earlier. They put him in there. Yeah, in the bug house. Yeah. So, and what made them? So, so after that, was there any retaliation? But you guys came. Well, we, there? we 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 came the street, but we couldn't find nobody. They was like ghosts. Okay. So now, moving forward. Um, what made them put him in the home? In Manawa, not no home, home, in prison. In prison, in Manawa, yeah. pardon me. What they, made them put him in there? What did that, he that do? He, well, the provocation was, is that earlier on the day of May 31st, he supposed that assaulted a guy named Wilbur Lee, who pulled the gun on him, and he beat the dude with a stick and whatever, and the police came. He supposed that assaulted the police, but don't get arrested. And he comes up town, and he's supposed to be teaching where Malcolm used to teach in front of the chock full of nuts. And the police was telling him that he had to move on and stuff of that nature. And he supposed that assaulted two Caucasian police, two Irish guys, <clears throat> and they called for reinforcements. And our job was one of the first born in the nation of uh, the five percent to say, and he was there that they came like it was a pre uh, ordained assassination uh, squad that they came from four directions in a matter of minutes when they arrested him, and they was getting busy. They wasn't letting them mess with the father. The young brothers was fighting and handling shit, and the father seen where it was going. And he stopped it by telling them, don't kill my sons. And those are the words that our driver said he uttered. Don't kill my sons, and I'll go with you. And he went, and they took him downtown. That was on May 31st, 1965. Hmm. And he went to prison for the next 22 months. Okay. And then you went to go see him. Yeah. Felt the bullet on the shoulder and all that larger shoulder. Cool. Mm -hmm. Now he said you got to take the shot. He told each. He said you guys got to take the shot. He used that word. Yeah, it, it was the circumstances was that we was in the gambling hole, the same gambling hole that he got shot in. Right. This was after he came home from Manawa. It was around, I think, December '67, and he had already got to school dealing with Lindsay and all that. Mm -hmm. And he was going to uh, a party. They called it the Cop and Robbers Party at uh, Lindsay. Bear, uh, Lindsay's chief aide, what's his name? Barry Gotham wrote it about it in his book, uh, The Mayor's Man, mm -hmm. in the section called A Man Called Allah. And before the father went, he had me job in Dubai in the basement. And he was telling us that he wanted us to go with him, escort him, that is, downtown to the party. Mm -hmm. But he took us through a little test. I had a 3 8 on me for security purposes. Me job in Dubai. And <laughs> 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 do security. I like that though. <laughs> yeah. And he knew it and he took it out of my waist. Now, the guys that was gambling, they didn't see him take it out of my waist. We was on the side. But he went in the hole where they used to shoot the dice under the lamp. And, like, he was getting ready to spray them. He wasn't going to spray them, but he acted like he was. And they broke out. I'm talking about they got up out of This is the same place he got shot. And it was an old dude named Foot. He had a brown Cadillac. And he had bad feet. So he couldn't run. So now the only ones in the basement is the father, me, Jabba, and Dubai, and Foots. And Foots, oh, come on, Allah, don't play with that gun. Don't play with that gun. He was, like, really trembling. All them other guys ran, and the father say, yeah, they got fear of God. That's why they ran. Y'all don't. You know, and that's when he told us in no uncertain terms after he took us through a little test. He put the gun to job ahead, right between the eyes, and said, pow. And Jabba didn't blink. 
He went to Dubai next. Same thing. It was at Powell. And Dubai didn't blink. Then he came to me and said, Powell. And I didn't blink. And that's when he told us, yeah, we don't have no fear of God. Hmm. You know why we didn't have no fear of God? Because he wasn't scared to die? No, because we was God. And we knew that he wasn't going to hurt us. Them other people had fear because they didn't know whether or not he was going to hurt them or not. Because they might have been in the basement when he got shot. Mm. That was the same basement. But we didn't have no fear. And he told us that he wanted us to escort him to that party. But we didn't go escort him. We met him that Friday night at the school and escorted him to 127th Street and St. Nicholas Avenue Subway. That's mm -hmm. 125th Street Station. Mm -hmm. But that exit was 127th Street. Mm -hmm. And me and ja me and uh, Java stayed upstairs. Dubal went down with him. And he told us to be there at 12 o'clock because that's when he coming back. And they went down there to that party, the Cops and Roger party that Barry, I mean, uh, Barry Gartha spoke about in his book. And he was threatened that night by the super district attorney of New York, Burton Roberts. And I, and I had the Bronx. And that's what he came upstairs. And that's the first thing he told me, that Burton Roberts threatened him, that he could be a law in New York County. He could be a law in Kings County. He could be a law in Queens County. But if he came up to the Bronx telling people that he a law, he going to have his black ass put in jail. And that's what happened to me in 1971. I was the one that was responsible for the teachings in the Bronx. So. Yeah. So bring us back to, before we talk about that, bring us back to the day that he died. Yeah, that was June 13, 1969. And it was a beautiful day. And his mother said that he stayed at his mother's, house uh she had a boarding house on 139th street 249 and he had a brother that named john he had a room there uh wilbert he had a room there and the father had uh the room in uh, apartment one they was all broken down apartment one kitchen was on the first floor i laid and he had a younger brother named harry he was in apartment 11 i later had apartment 11 myself but his mother said that that morning he woke up and said he had the best sleep that he ever had in his life. And she tried to convince him not to go out. She had a premonition that she asked him, is there anything that you could do to stay home and not go where you got to go? And he told her, they must have been on it, that mom, when they want you, they gonna get you. Ain't nothing you could do. And he left her that day. And that was that morning. And then that whole day, I wasn't there. The last time I seen him was June 11th. And he told me, he told me to stay in the Bronx and teach the babies. He didn't want me there. He done gave me what I had to get and don't even come near him. And he chased me with my little crew back to the Bronx, June 11th. And what do you mean chase you? Get the f out of here. Don't come down here no more. <laughs> Word? Word. My duty was up in the Bronx with them children. He didn't need me no more. He gave me what he had to give me. And I didn't get the picture until he gave it to me like that to let me know how serious he was. So you went back down to see him in Harlem? On June 11th. I ain't go see him after that. No, I know. I'm, I'm talking, that's about June 11th. Yeah. And then you went to go see him, and then he looked at you and said, get out of he here. He chased me out of Harlem. There's a brother named you, Allah, tell you the same thing. He chased us up out of Harlem. He didn't want us down there no more. But it really was that if I'd have been on the set, I would have seen what was going on or who was scoping on him. You know, I'd have seen who was scoping. And that's what I knew he knew. And he didn't want me to see that because I would have did whatever had to be done to prevent it. Mm. Yeah. Because in that same spot where he chased me from, I had knocked out a dude that went in his back pocket on him. A dude named Do Funny. You know? And he used to be a bully. 
but I was like quick on the draw, so to speak, you know, but I would have detected it. So he chased me out, so I couldn't detect it. So that whatever had to happen on June 13th had to happen. And there wasn't no stopping it. And he knew that. You know? So you, how many guys were you with when you ran? How many what? How many guys were there with you when y'all ran? Because how you changed We didn't them? run. I mean, like, I know, that's I know. a matter of expression. We didn't, we, we, we had it up. We got out of town. Yeah, we got we out walked, of Dodge. Yeah, walked away, right? Yeah, we walked away. Yeah. You know, grudgingly. We didn't want to leave. We came from uh, uptown, the Bronx, mm -hmm. 180th Street, downtown, 126th Street, to, get to, be, to, to be there with them, to yeah. be around them. That's all. It was after 8 o'clock. I done took care of all the children uptown. Now we're going to be, we're going to get what we want just to be around them. Mm. So then you go back to the Bronx, and that day, what yeah. was he doing? What was he going? He was what teaching. He was He was teaching hard. Cause it, cause the brothers that was there, it was about twelve brothers when he left about three thirty. He mm -hmm. didn't chase them out. He gave them what he had to give them. It was about twelve of them. You know, we call that the Last Supper. He was a thirteen man, and he had twelve people at the table. And you know who say that they was there? Who? Uh, Doctor Smalls. Doctor Robert Smalls. Okay. He's he's one of the black historians today that followed down the line of Dr. Jeffries, uh, Dr. Ben. In fact, he was trained under Dr. Ben. You familiar with Dr. Ben? Yes. Yeah, he was. Dr. Smalls was trained under Dr. Ben, but he said that he was there that night when the father left, cause they had a thing at the Holland State Office Building and the Black Panthers and the Black Nationalists was protesting the building of the Harlem State Office building, and they was coming to our school to use the bathroom and hang out. But he said he was there that night. I don't know if he was counted amongst the 12, but he claimed that he was there that night. And then he he was, he, walk, he was walking. He took a cab, and his brother usually used to come and pick him up in a cab, his youngest brother, ALR. Mm -hmm. But he didn't come that night. But a cab picked him up and took him to his wife's apartment on 112th Street, 21 West, 112th Street. And he got shot in the elevator of that building seven times, but they fired eight times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they said the funeral was, was they, you know, they brought it, it was big. Yeah, well, it was, we had seven buses. You know, that's the first time I seen seven buses uh, as a procession ride through Harlem. It was big. It was reported, highly reported, especially in Amsterdam News. Uh, Les Matthews was the featured uh, writer, and he wrote a hell of a fine article about the father. That was one of his friends, too. What did that do to you, his death? Well, I tell you, man. He told me that when he go home. That's what he I, called it? Yeah, that's what he called it. When he go home, that we was going to be dead for a year. And we was literally dead for a year. It was a devastating blow. Uh, we didn't have... He said he wasn't our leader, but he led us in the right direction. We didn't have no leader. We had to fend for ourselves, as he said, that we had to show and prove for ourselves because he wasn't going to be here to do it for us. But to say it and then be young and have to do it, you know, where you had an adult, you know, giving you the guidance and all the guidance that you need you're getting from an adult. And then all of a sudden you got to do everything for yourself. You got to figure all this shit out. And then you figuring out, the worst situation. You ain't figuring out the best situation. You ain't figuring out uh, spending this money, enjoying this woman, eating this good food. You know, you figuring out, damn, who killed the father? Damn, how I'm going to find this? Damn, is they watching us? Is they going to, you know, hit us? Is they going to shoot us? 
and we walking, we working with all this, but all the time that we working with all that, we looking for whoever did this, and 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 everything is cold. We couldn't get no leads, no hints, no nothing. Everything so was cold. So nothing up to this day. There's no nothing, nothing at all. Well, oh, 